<laughs> cool. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm in the Kerouac house. Um, the only thing I've changed really for, for this event is that I've turned the, the sculpted head around. It's normally facing the door. So that's, that's Jack Kerouac in the corner. Um, but yeah, so what, what I'm going to read, I'm going to read a short story and then just the opening of, of my novel that I published um, uh, a few years ago. Um, the story, it's published in an uh, American journal called The New Guard um, late last year. Um, it was a finalist for a competition. It's published as fiction, but it's actually, it's actually closer to creative nonfiction. Um, so my parents, uh, as I listen to this, you know, they'll recognize some of the events that are, are being recalled. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll just jump into it. Uh, Danger, love, magic. I wasn't trying to kill myself when I was four and I jumped into that river in France. And it wasn't an attempt to get attention or an act of protest against my parents' decision to move our family abroad. I was excited to be living in the little village of Salignac, where I quickly developed an ever ravenous taste for freshly baked baguettes and jam filled croissants. And while every day couldn't have been sunny, I can't recall an exception. Best of all was how wholesome the air was. Most children might not have noticed that, but for me, it was a life changer. Uh, at three, I had been diagnosed with a severe case of asthma, and it was exacerbated in my hometown in Ireland, which situation in a valley served as a dust bowl. In Salignac, I could breathe more ably, and so I greedily gulped down the air, and I felt newly robust, perhaps more than was good for me. It was summer, and there were a number of adults swimming in the glistening river. Between the river and a picnic area, from where my parents were keeping an eye on me, there was a shallow pool and I was paddling about in it, along with some other small children. It should have been a safe place to play, except the far edge of the pool was connected to the river by a waterfall, only a few feet high. When my widening eyes were drawn to that foaming rainbow, I imagined it to be a kind of magic slide. Although I couldn't swim, I wasn't worried about what might happen to me in the river. That, that would require thinking a step ahead. And I just wanted to experience the thrill of rushing down the magic slide. So all elbows and knees, I splashed my way over and without hesitating, I launched myself into the waterfall. The waterfall crashed and heaved about me and there were probably shouts of alarm that I didn't hear. And then I was in the river and I was being thrust downstream. I wasn't scared, but that was due to innocence, not bravery. It was happening so fast, and while the air had been knocked out of my lungs, I was used, used to breathing struggles. And the idea that I was in mortal danger didn't occur to me. If anything, I felt vibrantly alive. When you're drowning in a river, I discovered, you sink under the surface, then you float up and gasp a mouthful of air, then you sink deeper, then you float up, not quite reaching the surface this time, then you sink again and you keep on sinking. I remember being surrounded by whirling bubbles and a growing gloom and I could no longer tell which way was up and there was an eerie calm to the experience. And then arms grabbed my arms and pulled. I don't have a clear image of the man who saved my life. At times I've imagined him having had a thick black, black mustache, but I doubt that's right. He was likely to have been French and thanks to some dubious cultural stereotyping, I have it in my head that French men have a higher rate of mustaches than men of other nationalities. I think this is why I stamped one on him. In the extra seconds it would have taken for someone else to dive in and try to fish me out, it would have been too late. So if he hadn't already been swimming in the river when I embarked on my adventure, I would have died. My savior carried me out of the river and set me down on my rubbery legs in the paddling pool. And then I did become scared because I saw my parents running towards me and it was apparent from their pale faces that I'd given them a terrible shock. I've always laughed as I've told this story to friends. There, there's no lasting harm done and the joke is always on me and how foolhardy I was. And my friends who either share my dark sense of humor or politely tolerate it, have laughed with me. But when I've brought up, to, brought up my parents, they haven't laughed. My, my mother's shoulders tense and my father's brow furrows. And one or the other says, we almost lost you that day. My dip in the river is in my only violent memory of Salignac. There was a wall made of stacked stones partitioning a farmer's field from a mucky country road. And I remember standing at the corner of the road while a grinning bigger boy took stones from the wall and hurled them at me. 
I don't know why I didn't run away. Maybe I was frozen with fear or I judged his aim to be poor and I was confident I could dodge his missiles. Or I might have been waiting to be struck because I thought stones would bounce off me. I suspected that my destiny was to be a superhero, so my powers would be kicking in sooner or later. And then my hands on my hips and my arms forming triangles at my sides, I would mock my brash tormentor for failing to recognize my invincibility. But then, but then he threw a stone that cracked me in the head, just above my left eye, and my hands from anguish face, I crumpled to the ground. I still have a scar from that incident, a small squarish one, or at least that's what I've always attributed it to. There's a chance it's actually a pockmark from when I had chicken pox, but I'd rather blame the bully stone, so I'll stick with that. And there was another day when a fun fair came to the village, and after pleading with my mother that I was old enough and on this occasion I would be careful, I was rarely granted permission to ride a bumper car. It was a two-seater and my older sister, who must have been annoyed at having to mind her bad luck pest of a brother, was in charge of driving. But when another car rammed into the back of ours, I, I lurched forward and spat my face hard into the steering wheel, causing blood to gush from my nose or my mouth and quivering chin. I wailed until my mother ran over and rescued me from the car. And then, like an uncommonly maternal magician, she produced tissue after tissue from her handbag to staunch the bleeding. My blood wasn't yet dry in the tissues when I asked her if I could go again. This time she couldn't be swayed. Despite what happened with the river and with the bully and with the bouncer car, I felt incredibly welcomed in Solignac. I attracted attention for having the reddest hair of any child in France, and my attempts to speak French were treated as endearing, regardless of how my piratical accent and my tendency to invent words original to any language made me incomprehensible. It was on the day I turned five that I felt most at home, and the entire country seemed to be as excited as I was. There were parades along the streets and festive cheer abounded, so, so much so that my father had to explain to me what drunkenness was. It's when people drink too much alcohol, something you're not allowed to have, and it causes them to be a bit too happy. But dad, aren't they all happy for me because it's my birthday? Of course, it's, it's mainly that. After sunset, there were fireworks on top of a hill and crowds gathered to and awe at the explosions of light cascading across the starry sky. Being a reasonably well-mannered boy, I said merci beaucoup, announcing it as merci bucket to everyone I passed. I was met by quizzical looks, but I assumed this was because these kind people thought celebrating my existence was only natural, so no show of gratitude was necessary. It was slightly strange, however, that July 14th uh, was known as Bastille Day. I suppose that Bastille could have been a French word for my name, even though they don't sound at all alike. While I can't remember my babysitter's name or her face, I'm pretty sure that she had chestnut brown hair and she smelled of flowers. I hugged her whenever I could and she thought this was cute, so she gave me big hugs in return, pressing my face against her stomach, but I never got the courage to confess that I planned to marry her, unless I managed to mumble a proposal into her woolen jumper. One evening she put me to bed and after tucking me in tight so that my arms were pinned under my blanket, she planted a pair of kisses on my flaming cheeks, then she turned off my light and went downstairs. Unable to sleep because my mind was buzzing. She wouldn't have kissed me if she didn't love me too. I kicked and punched my blanket away and crept out of my room. With the stairs at the end, the landing was lined by a balustrade that overlooked the rustic living room. And in my blue pajamas, I lay on my stomach and peered down from between two of the balusters. The fireplace was set in the far wall and my babysitter was sitting sideways in the cozy armchair across from it, her feet hanging over one of the arms. She was reading a book and the fire was going strong and she was bathed in its warmth. I felt warmer as well watching her. I concentrated on making myself invisible, another superpower I was hoping to forge. And it seemed to be working because she didn't catch sight of me out of the corner of her eye. But as captivating as she was, there was only so, so long that I could lie there without having anything else to occupy my attention, and I decided to go get some company. On a low shelf just inside the door of a spare room, the, house, the house's previous tenants had left behind a small wooden figure of an old peasant woman. She had a flat base and a round top, and her shape was along the spectrum between an Easter egg and a bowling pin. Her shawl and dress were painted red and green, and she was olive-skinned and slow-eyed. 
She would rattle when I shook her, but I hadn't yet figured out what her secret was. After stealthily re retrieving the mysterious toy, I resumed my position on the landing. My babysitter hadn't moved. Her book must have been a good one, and she was still aglow in the firelight. I alternated between watching her and studying the peasant woman in my hands. She was smooth all over, except for a crease around her middle. And when I twisted her top half one way and her lower half the other, I was surprised to find that she came apart and I could lift her top half off. Nestled inside was another, another peasant woman, her double but smaller. I proceeded to pull the double out and she twisted apart two to reveal yet a third woman. There were six in total. I wasn't aware that together they were known as a Russian doll or even that such a thing existed. And shifting along the landing, I arranged them in a row, largest to smallest, placing each figure within the shadow cast by her very own baluster. Then I rested my cheek against the pillow I made with my hands and I let myself doze off, safe in the knowledge that once my babysitter sensed where I was, she would come and gently wake me. She would see the magic I had performed and we would share in the wonder of all that was possible. Um, yeah, that's the story. Um, it's probably the least dark thing I've written and it still includes me almost drowning and getting the hit in the head by a rock. Um, but yeah, the other thing I'll read is a bit torture. I'm just going to read the opening to my novel, which is um, this. Um, so the novel is called The Fractured Life of Jimmy Dice. And this is chapter one, which is called Death, which, as I said, I tend to write dark. Um, July 1980. I was alive once briefly. I'm just not sure if it counts. It was 35 years ago and I was dying at the time. I closed my tiny eyes against the slicing light. I attempted to gasp, choking deeper instead. My purple body shook and something crumbled inside me. I faded into darkness, receding from screams. I remember being born again, but it's not quite real. It isn't my birth. The screams are the same, so is the room and the panic flurries of activity. And the baby I think is me, my vibrantly healthy twin is pushed and pulled into the world in my way, then lifted into gentle but unyielding hands and we are carried into a corner away from where our mother lies. She's been gutted of life, not hers, mine. My husk has already been taken away, but I remain with my twin. We are one with each other now, with the solid arms of the nurse holding us and with the people behind her. The stern faced obstetrician, his composure slips, yells shit when he hits his elbow against the corner of a silver tray, and a bloodied forceps is then crashing across the floor. The other nurse, a young student, who as she lunges to retrieve the forceps, is silently praying that she'll never again witness a birth as shocking as mine. Our father trying and failing to soothe our mother by telling her how much he loves her. We are one with her too. Our mother is the room's epicenter. Her wailing ends abruptly, her eyes are moving but vacant, and she's too distraught to feel her husband gripping her hand. She'll never know that I'm still here. I'm with the living baby who gurgles to the nurse's humming in her rocking arms. In the midst of this wreckage, we feel peace. We are betrayed. We are lifted and the remainder of the umbilical cord is cut from our belly. We are slapped, we yell. The nurse swings us around to face our mother. Grace, you have a beautiful baby boy. Our mother squeezed our father's hand and she almost smiles before anguish clouds into her eyes. And in her confusion, she mistakes the saved baby for the lost one. Get him away from me, he's dead, get him away. As the obstetrician prepares a sedative, the nurse pulls us to her warm breast and retreats. We are carried through the doors as our father bites his tongue as our mother, Grace, screams over and over. We are cleaned, weighed, wrapped in a snug white blanket, sheltered in a glass box, goggled at. The world floods around us, vague colors blurring together. We meet our father. He has a crooked smile, sad but genuine. His finger touches our palm and we clench it, marveling at the existence of our hand and what we can do. We gurgle, his eyes well up, Tears splashes on our nose. Our father laughs. He wipes his eyes with his trembling hand, then runs it through his thick, coal black hair. 
it sticks up at odd angle of tufts. He extricates his finger from our grip and dries our nose by pressing it. Hey fellow, my name is Eamon, I'm your dad. When you grow up, I promise the world is yours. My twin, unimpressed by the prospect, falls asleep. Our father, Eamon, leaves us, stepping outside the room ever so quietly. I'm incapable of creating my own dreams, but I enter those of my twin, believing that they belong to both of us. I'm too new to realize the truth yet. As I said, this all takes place a long time ago. I won't form an understanding of my nature until years later, but I'll give you a head start. My twin and I are bound. I have some capacity for movement, a leash permitted me, permitting me a short radius in any direction. I can see everything in his line of sight, but his eyes are not mine. I can see when his are closed. I can see above, below, and behind him. When focused, I can see it all simultaneously, but I can also look away. And I have a talent. If someone is in our proximity, I can look them in the eye and go deeper. I can sift through their memories and feel what they feel. The things they've forgotten are inaccessible, but the experiences that make them who they are, these are open to me. They never sense my presence. Whether I'm journeying through a single memory or combining multiple points of view, and I admit to bridging the gaps with informed guesses from time to time, I see it all like it's happening before me. I'll get to the real now in due course. As a conscientious narrator, I'll try to keep embellishments to a minimum, but I make no promises. My twin is your tragic protagonist. His name will be James, but to me, and perhaps to you, he's Jimmy Dice. This is the edifying tale of his fractured life. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, if, if that's not clear, it's a disembodied dead twin novel. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, for, for reading to us. Um, you know, what are you what are you working on right now while you're while you're at the Kerouac house? Um, I'm working on a novel set in Antarctica in the near future called There's Something Wrong With Us. Um, so it's um, it's it, it's it's going to be like a, a documentary by the time it's done, considering considering the way things are going. But, um, yeah, no, the Kerouac house has been a really good place to to write, and the pandemic has been oddly um, inspiring. <laughs> um, I don't know if anybody else had any questions or comments or anything. Um, if you do, just jump on in. But um, I don't know, I guess one, because we, we've talked a little bit about this before, but I feel like people might be interested in knowing about kind of your arrival here, kind of coinciding with everything going on. So it really hasn't been, the, your writer's residency, it really hasn't been quite the experience you imagined it would be. Do you want to maybe uh, tell us a little bit sure. about it? Sure. Well, like, like this is like the third residency I've done, and they're they're never how you imagine them to be. <laughs> um, but um, this is probably on, on a different level of of not <laughs> of, um, anticipating it. Um, but um, yeah, like it, it, it it's strange. Like the house, is, like it, it's great to be. Like for one thing, I have about three or four times as much space as I would in my flat in Dublin. So it's good having all the space and to be able to have like a work area that's different from where you're relaxing. And to be in a place, you know, that you know this kind of iconic writer worked in, it kind of makes the endeavor of being a writer seem more possible. So that's kind of inspiring. Um, I, I definitely have a feeling of being a stranger in a strange land, um, but I think that's kind of true for everyone, <laughs> uh, wherever they are at the moment. I think if I was in my flat in Dublin, I would feel like a, a stranger in a strange land. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's been um, I'll. I'll the zero chance that I will ever forget this residency. <laughs> <laughs> a really lasting imprint on me. <laughs> well, I, uh, I appreciate you taking the time to join us virtually for this. And, uh, you know, please do keep in touch and let us know how things are going for you. So, but yeah, th thanks a million, Tiffany. I appreciate it. Problem. And Have a good thanks, one. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank yeah. you, Ronan. I enjoyed it. Let thank me know you. if you need anything. This is Karen, by the way. Yeah, it's great, I'm three quarters of the way through the book and loving it. So uh, yeah, thank you. it's nice to hear you read it and get that voice in my head for, for the Thanks, end of it. <laughs> and I'll uh, I'll post a link to the to the book on the event page and everything too. So. Oh, great, cool. Great.
All right. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Bye. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Ronan. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks.